Welcome to Food for Thought. Today's episode is Animal Friendly Gardens. Plants, trees, and flowers named after animals. Welcome everybody, Colleen Patrick Goudreau here. I'm your host. You can find me at joyfulvegan.com. You can find me on social media. Thank you so much for listening to Food for Thought and for subscribing to Food for Thought wherever you listen to podcasts. And thanks for sharing it, obviously, and for leaving ratings and reviews. Food for Thought is also a 100% listener-supported podcast, so thank you for supporting it. You can join other listeners in supporting this podcast and receiving the podcast transcripts as well as other bonuses and perks by going to patreon.com slash Colleen Patrick Goudreau. I'll tell you about this a little bit later on, but there is a new feature at Patreon, which I'm quite thrilled about. It's something I had a long time ago, a long time ago when you were supporting this podcast when it was just supported through PayPal. And that is annual patronage. So you can make a pledge depending on what level you choose, and you can pay annually as opposed to monthly. And I'll talk to you about that in a little bit. But most of all, thank you for being here. It's been wonderful to connect with so many of you through my online cooking classes that I've been hosting every week. They have been a life saver for me, for I hear from so many of you, they've been so much fun. And it's just It's just been wonderful to share the recipes that I've developed over the years with you in classes, in real time, from wherever you are around the world. We just had our homemade tofu class that 80 people were registered for, which was just fantastic. And I will most likely be teaching that class again. When you sign up for the classes, you get the recipes in advance. So you can cook along with me if you choose. You don't have to. Many people just like to watch and ask questions. And of course, you get a recording of the class at the end. If you can't make the classes, you can purchase most of them. I'm still getting some of the old ones up uh, at joyfulvegan.com, but you can you can purchase the recipes and the video recording once the class is over. Each class has a different theme, and we've got some really fun ones coming up. So go to joyfulvegan.com to check them out. And if you hear me telling you about classes that are coming up, and then you listen and you go check and that class is no longer uh, coming up because time has passed, that's what I mean when I say you can purchase the past classes and the recipes and the video recording. So we've got homemade bagels bagels, which I have to tell you, if you've never made bagels from scratch, it's so satisfying and it's they're more delicious than any bagel you will buy in the store. So homemade bagels, breads, and biscuits, that's one class. We're doing an afternoon tea class coming up. We're doing two afternoon tea classes. One is sweets. So we're doing scones, lemon curd, and whipped cream. Yes, all vegan. Yes, with all plant foods and no animal products. Uh, so I'm excited about that class. And then we're also doing an afternoon tea and we're focusing on sandwiches. So we're doing eggless egg salad with watercress, cucumber dill with cream cheese and chives, roasted red pepper with a arugula. So a lot of very traditional, delicious tea sandwiches that would be served at an afternoon tea. And I will be talking about the difference between afternoon tea and high tea uh, in these classes. We've got a Joy of Vegan baking class coming up and we're going to do a lot of those over the next year. This particular one is focused on chocolate. So we're doing chocolate bun cake, chocolate pudding, and chocolate fudge. And you can see that I try to just really create a lot of variety in the different recipes that I teach. It's not just all the same. It's not all cakes or all puddings or all pies. So I try to break it up so you get a lot of different skills in these classes. We're doing a soups and stews class with uh, African sweet potato and peanut stew, carrot ginger soup, and magical miso soup. And I'm already working on our fall and winter classes for Thanksgiving, for the holidays. So stay tuned. Let me know what you'd like to see. And I I pretty much do what you tell me to do. So if you're looking for a particular class, and I think there's a demand, I'll, I can try it out and see if people sign up and, and it's worth the shot. So joyfulvegan.com is where you can find all the classes. And if you are a Patreon supporter, you do receive 10% off the classes. So check your email and your Patreon account for your discount code. 
I hope you're all doing fabulously well. It's really lovely to be here. I don't think I've mentioned it, but my office has been a construction zone since April because everything got shut down and locked down because of COVID. And we were in the middle of replacing some bookshelves and it means we had torn out the old ones so that we could measure properly. And my office has been torn up since then. And I've had no printer and I haven't even been able to record the podcast. This is the first time we're still not completely moved in. Uh, but this is the first time I'm recording here in my office with a new microphone because the other one also just died in the middle of all of this. <laughs> and as soon as we're all back to normal, you may hear some kitties again because I'm looking forward to fostering cats again. And my office is where our foster cats live. So it's just really good to be here with everything that's going on and having you know, produced a number of different episodes on kind of the pandemic and how to cope with all the anxiety and the fear and the anger and, and you know, the overconsumption of plastic and everything that's happening in these previous episodes, I've addressed those kind of heavier topics. But I thought today would be really good to go back to a lighter topic, one that I think you'll find, I hope, fun and enjoyable and interesting and fascinating as I do. And it's a topic you know I love, and that is animal-related words and expressions. Now, you know that I started a spinoff podcast called Animology, which became too much to manage with, with everything else, but the episodes are still there. So you could always go over to wherever you listen to podcasts and find Animology, which is the name of the podcast, and find all of those episodes. And someday, I am so certain it will be a book. I'm certain of it. it. I just don't know when because it requires so much research and time. And it's fa- fascinating. I love it so much, but I could just do- I could just devote all my time to that. And yet I wouldn't be able to pay my bills. So I have to, <laughs> I can't just do that, even though I frankly would, would probably be quite happy doing that. So we're going to talk about animologies and I'm calling these animological plants because these are plants Uh, flowers, trees, ferns, what have you, uh, even uh, fungi we're going to talk about today. And we're going to talk about those that have animal related names. Uh, For me, it's not just about kind of the novelty of it at all. It's not just how fun it is to discover that. To me, the animal related words and expressions we discover in our language, and obviously I'm talking about the English language, but there are many similar animologies in other languages as well. For me, these animologies illustrate how deeply connected we are to other animals, how much they're in our consciousness and in our hearts, sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously. And that's why I think it's really important to talk about this. Now, you remember an episode I did in Animology podcast called, it was about geographical place names. This is one example. I've done, you know, uh, body parts, our anatomical body parts that have animals hidden in the names of these body parts. I have done many different kinds of topics like that. I did a geographical place name. So we had Oxford, York, Khartoum, Kosovo, Boca Raton, Hartford. These are just a few Uh, towns, cities around the world that have animals hidden in their names. Now, you're going to have to listen to that episode to find out where the animals are hiding in Khartoum, uh, though you can probably spot the animal in a place like Oxford. Now, we're going to do the same thing here in this episode. We're going to examine the plants, the trees, the flowers that have animals in their names, sometimes hidden, sometimes obvious, sometimes in their botanical names, their scientific names, and sometimes in their common names. And I think you'll love this as much as I do. By the end of this episode, I hope you will be as inspired as I am to walk around the neighborhood. David and I go on a walk every day, and I walk around pointing out and asking him to find the animological plants. Just say that. I think that's the best new phrase that I've coined, animological plants. Uh, And I hope that you'll be inspired to maybe plant some of them in your own garden and really enjoy them for for the reasons they're they're named after animals. Now, if you're looking for an animal friendly garden, meaning an animal a garden without animal products, there is an episode I have at Food for Thought called Vegan Gardening. And then I talked about this a little bit m- more when I did the interview with Nancy Lawson on humane and native gardening. Uh, it was only one of the few episodes I had where I was interviewing someone else, and I love Nancy. And she has a wonderful book called uh, it's called the Humane Gar- Humane Gardener, right? I'm blanking, but I think that's what it is. And in that episode, we talk about animal-friendly gardens from a lot of angles. So check that out as well. But today, we're going to talk about plants named after animals. 
if I've done my job, you will have an animal garden by the end of this. So let's start with the names of plants where the animals are apparent. And already I am hoping you are sitting there thinking, this plant or that plant or this tree or that tree. And I hope you're already thinking about this because that's the fun of it as well. You start to see things through this lens, through the lens of animologies, and you recognize all of the words and expressions we have that have animals hidden within. So let's start with some that are most likely familiar to you wherever you live. We'll start with dandelion. Now you've probably seen and said the name of this plant so many times, but never noticed the animal hidden in it. Lion, dandelion. It comes into English from Middle French, uh, dent de lion, meaning lion's tooth. D-E-N-T, dent de lion. De, so you can hear it in the you can hear that in the French uh, in the middle uh, in, in, in the middle from the Middle English uh, dandelion 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 because of its toothed leaves. So the tooth of the lion is why we call dandelions dandelions because their leaves look like they're toothed. They're, they look like tooths. Tooths. That's a funny plural. Uh, anyway, <laughs> moving on from dandelion to buckeye. So you may have heard of the buckeye tree, especially if you're from Ohio in the United States, the state's official tree, and it's been the state's nickname since 1953, the Buckeye State. Uh, the name buckeye stems from Native Americans who called the nut hetuk, which means buckeye, because its nuts, the nuts of the buckeye tree, resemble the shape and color of a deer's eye, a buck, a male deer. And the buckeye, as I said, is common in Ohio, and it grows along rivers and streams and in floodplains. And what I'm expecting you to do as you're listening to this, and again, remember, if you are a supporter, you will get this episode, you will get the transcripts, you don't have to write all this down, you will get this transcript in your Patreon account. But what I'm also expecting you to do, all of you, is to go and search for images of the plants that I'm naming here so that you can see for yourself the resemblance. And you'll see it in the dandelion leaf, you'll see the tooth leaves, and you'll see it in the buckeye nut. You'll see the deer's eye because it's kind of brown on the outside and dark on the inside. And it looks like a, it looks like a buck's eye. <laughs> okay, so the next one is kangaroo paw. Now I love these flowers. I see these plants all around here where we live uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Now you might not be surprised to know that the kangaroo paw flower is native to Australia. They're also called cat paws and that might be more common in Australia, but I'm only familiar um with them as kangaroo paws. They're tubular flowers, they're coated with dense hairs, and they open at the apex with six claw-like structures. And from it's from this paw-like structure, this formation, that the common name kangaroo paw is derived. Now, our northern California climate is very conducive to growing plants, mostly from the Mediterranean, also from South Africa, but we also have some plants that do very well from Australia and New Zealand. So kangaroo paws is one of them. They have yellow flowers or red flowers, and they're very distinct. And as soon as you see them, if you look them up, they look like little animal paws, uh, like I said, either red or yellow. So kangaroo paws, I encourage you to look those up. Last night we were walking around, I knelt down to this very low growing perennial and I pointed to it, asked David, poor David, I quiz him all the time on things. He doesn't study, he doesn't know, he doesn't read like I do. And I'm just a horrible wife because I was like, what's this? He did get this one right. And he said lamb's ears. So lamb's ears, if you have never seen lamb's ears, just go to a nursery. Be super fun. Also, if you if you look these up, and then go to a nursery, even if you can't or don't grow them in your in your garden, go to a nursery and, and check out these plants that I'm talking about. Lamb's ears are so soft. They're ridiculous. And that's why they're called lamb's ears. They have these very soft, woolly, evergreen leaves. They're silver to gray green in color. And they are similar in shape and softness to that of a real lamb's ears, hence its name. So they can bloom in the summer and they'll also produce some pretty uh, pink or purple flowers. And uh, apparently, when I was doing research uh, uh, for this episode, apparently they can be used, the leaves can be used as a Band-Aid of sorts for healing wounds and helping painful bee stings. Who knew? I didn't know. Did you know that? 
Next, we have a tropical plant that I'm not familiar with. I've never seen it. I don't think. I mean, I possibly could have seen it, but didn't know what it was called. And that's elephant ears. And you can understand why it's called that as well. It's this bold tropical plant and it's named because the large leaves, the large foliage is reminiscent of elephant's ear. So if you look it up, you will see that. You will see the resemblance indeed. Cat's claw is a tropical vine which can grow up to almost a hundred feet tall. And its name comes from its hooked thorns which resemble the claws of a cat. It's found mainly in the Amazon rainforest. I've never seen it that I know of. Uh, and in other tropical areas of South and Central America. But again, look for it online and you will see, you will definitely see the claw, the, uh, the part of the, the vine that looks like a cat's claw. And that is cat's claw. Now here's one. This is the name of a town near us here in the San Francisco Bay area. It's in the North Bay, just north of San Francisco but it is a flower and it is called larkspur. So speaking of claws, you've got lark, as in the bird, lark, spur. So it's not larks, purr, it's larks, it's lark spur. So it's the spur of a lark, of a bird. And so what we have here is the flower resembles a lark's foot with a long curving back spur. You can imagine what that looks like. And that's why it's called a lark spur. Why the lark specifically? I don't know. <laughs> but, but, but that's why it's called a lark spur is because the flower itself has this long curving um, you know, part of the flower that looks like a spur. Now what's also really interesting is the lark spur are, it's cousin, the lark spur flower is cousin of the delphinium which is also an animology. Now I could tell you to just stay tuned and wait. Should I do that? Or do you want to know now? So the delphinium, delphiniums are called such, can you guess? Because it comes from the Greek delphis, meaning dolphin. And you can see when you look up the delphinium, or maybe you have one in your garden, the flower bud, it resembles a leaping dolphin. So again, type in delphinium, you know, you can even just type in delphinium and dolphin, and you will see photos that w you can absolutely see the dolphin leaping. It's pretty cool. And you'll also be able to see the spur of a lark. So lark spur and delphinium, both related cousins, and they are both animologies. Now, the next one is pretty obvious. There's a flower called the, or there's actually a whole group of flowers called the stork's bill or the heron's bill. Heron, as in the bird, stork, as in the bird. And they're one of several flowering plants of the genus uh, Erodium in the geranium family. Geranium is an animology, and I'm going to wait to get to that. You're just going to have to wait for that one. But the common names stork's bill and heron's bill of these flowers refer to the five-parted, long, bill-like capsules which contain the seed. So if you just type in stork's bill and heron's bill, you might not see it right away. Type in heron's bill or stork's bill seed capsules, and you'll see then right away, you'll see these long shoots, and right away you'll be like, yep, that looks like the bill of a stork, <laughs> this very long, pointy uh, bill, beak. So stork's bill and heron's bill. I'm not familiar with those flowers. I haven't seen them to my knowledge, but being in the geranium family, I possibly have. So staying on the theme of flowers resembling birds, we have a very obvious one called the bird of paradise. This is also known as the crane flower. And this is a flowering plant native to South Africa. And again, we see it here. We have so many South African plants in the Bay Area. They just grow really well here. And bird of paradise is one of them. I remember the first time we saw bird of paradise, though, I have to say, was in Kauai when David and I were on our honeymoon. And it's really cute because it is one of the flowers that David can identify. I mean, not, not that he David knows a lot. David knows a lot of stuff. He just doesn't study flowers and plants, right? But uh, so that's why I was teasing that he's not reading up on this. And I'm doing more of the gardening and I'm doing more, of course, of the animologies. So when I test him and quiz him while we're walking around, it's not fair because he's not, you know, delving into this. But there are some plants he does know, and Bird of Paradise is one of them because he remembers them from our honeymoon uh, in Kauai. And they're really interesting. They're an evergreen perennial. 
and they have very dramatic flowers, also referred to, as I said, a crane flower. Uh, so you, and I think many South Africans refer to it as a crane flower, but you can see it, you can see the resemblance to the bird right away, but it's kind of like a Rorschach test. Depending on how you look at it, you either see a bird in flight if you look at the kind of the back part of it and the yellow part looks like kind of wings and looks like a bird in flight, or you can look at it and you can see this kind of goofy looking bird that you might, um, you might characterize as a, a bird's face and a head. So depending on how you look at it, but either way, that's why it's called the bird of paradise because it looks like a bird. Now there we have something called a spider lily. Uh, you've probably heard of that. The red spider lily is how it's more commonly known. It's a plant in the amaryllis family. It's originally from the east. It's originally from China and Korea and Nepal. And it was introduced into Japan from there and then to the United States after that. So spider lilies get their name from the long spider-like stamens that protrude from the flowers. They're very dramatic. They look like red sparklers. You could call them uh, sparklers, <laughs> sparkler flowers. But you can see why they're called spider lilies. They're are also called hell flowers. They're also called red magic lilies and the equinox flower. So type that in spider lily, red spider lily, and you'll see that. Now a plant that might be more common to you regarding spiders is one that I have seen a million times called a spider plant. And these are very common house plants and they get their name from the small plantlets that are produced on long trailing stems and they vaguely resemble spiders because they have this kind of like clump in the center and then the little uh, like the center the center clump and then the babies kind of come off of that and all of the stems trail off of that so you can very easily see how it it's reminiscent of a spider it's also known as an airplane plant uh spider ivy and it's also known as a ribbon plant and hen and chickens now we're going to talk about hens and chickens a couple more times uh so just remember that but but the idea is that you've got these bigger clumps with the smaller clumps from that and that's why it's called hen and chickens or spider plant now We've got moving from kind of bodies and claws and what have you, we're going to move on to tails. We've got several plants that have, uh, that are reminiscent of animals' tails. The first is horsetail, and that's a perennial plant native throughout the Arctic and temperate regions of the Northern Hemisphere. And the name horsetail, it's often used for an entire group, arose because the branched species somewhat resemble a horse's tail. Now you can see this again if you look it up. And it's kind of cool about this this one, and you're going to see several others as we go on. It's not just the common name that has an animal in it, it's also the scientific name. So in this case, we've got horsetail as the common name of the plant. You can see why. But the scientific name also has horse in it. So Equisetum is the scientific name, the botanical name. And you can see the equus in there, equisetum, uh, equus meaning horse, Latin for horse, and cita, meaning bristle. So that's what, and they're beautiful plants. I did not know anything about horsetail plants before looking them up. They're ancient, ancient plants, and they're really quite beautiful. So scientific name, equisetum, common name, horsetail, and they're also called, so you get another <laughs> etymology, they're also called snake grass. They're sometimes referred to as snake grass as well. Another plant named for its resemblance to an animal's tail is lion's tail. But when I first looked it up, the search results were for a cocktail named lion's tail. And I have to tell you, not only did it inspire me to make the cocktail, to ask my husband to make the cocktail, it also reminded me to do an episode on cocktail animologies. So stay tuned. And if you're paying attention, you'll see two potential animologies in the word cocktail. Okay, so if you're curious, the lion's tail cocktail is made from bourbon. It's two ounces of bourbon, half ounce of lime juice, half ounce of allspice dram, one teaspoon of simple syrup, and two dashes of Angostura bitters. I have asked my husband to please make it for me. We have to get allspice dram, but we're making it happen. So I digress. Lion's tail, the plant. Like horsetail, lion's tail has an animal in the common name as well as in the botanical Latin name, and that's Leonatus leonorus. So L-E-O-N-O-T-I-S, 
right? That's the first word, and L-E-O-N-U-R-U-S, Leonatus Leonora. So you can see Leo in both of those words, and you can see the lion in there. Now, it's an evergreen shrub, semi-evergreen shrub, known for its really beautiful fuzzy orange flowers that resemble, you guessed it, a lion's tail, also native to South Africa. I haven't seen it here in the Bay Area, but I am going to look it up because it is so pretty. It's really dramatic. And it reminds me of a plant we actually have in our yard called a Cape Honeysuckle, which has really pretty orange flowers. But the the lion's tail is unique because, first of all, it's the orange flowers are a little fuzzier, but it grows in clusters. There's like a big cluster and then there's a, uh, then there's a small cluster after that. So they do really do look like lion's tails and they're really pretty. So lion's tail, Leonatus Leonora. So you can be really fancy and just call it that and impress all your friends. So foxtails are so named for their spikelet clusters of bristled seeds. You've seen foxtails, no doubt. They're dispersed as a unit, and they somewhat resemble the bushy tail of a fox, or at least someone thought so when they named this plant. Now, some species, of course, I know many of you uh, dog guardians ha- are very familiar with foxtails because they're incredibly dangerous to dogs. The tails um, point um, the, these foxtails basically have a pointed tip and they have these barbs that can become lodged in the ears of uh, and nostrils of dogs and other animals. So they're very dangerous. Not all species of the foxtails, but but some. So I know people are very wary, uh, especially in the summer when, uh, in the spring, when they can get those foxtails lodged in their throats. It's, 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 it's really scary. But foxtails called such because the bushy uh, plant looks like a foxtail. Then we have one more tail, the cattails. Now, if you have ever been near a pond or a river or a marsh or a lake that Mother Nature has been able to just take over, you will have seen cattails. They inhabit uh, fresh to slightly brackish waters and they're considered aquatic or semi-aquatic and they're really important to wildlife. Many species are cultivated ornamentally as pond plants and some you've seen in dried flower arrangements, but their long pointy shoots are reminiscent of the tails of cats hence their name. Then we have a plant, it's really adorable plant, you have to look this up, called the goldfish plant. And they earned their name because of their masses of red-orange pouch-like flowers that appear in the spring and summer, and they look like little goldfishes. They're really cute. They do look like little goldfishes with their little mouths like all puckered up. So look up goldfish plant and you'll see why they're called goldfish plants. But again, this is my point is that people who are naming these plants, animals are part of our consciousness, animals are part of our world, animals are part of our lives. And that's why they're naming these plants after animals, because that's top of mind for so many of us who just live in this world. We just know we're so connected to them. We have to reflect that in our behavior. We have to reflect that in our actions, in our laws, in our policies, because it's already reflected in our language. We have a tree called the elephant tree. It's a very rare tree. Uh, it's a, a, a it's northernmost species of small aromatic tropical trees, and they have very short, squat, stout, tapered trunks and branches that are reminiscent of elephants' legs and trunks, hence their name. Uh, they're very fat. You can see how stout they are if you just look up elephant tree uh, that are they're found in the Sonoran Desert of southwestern Arizona, also in southern California and northwestern Mexico. Uh, if you look them up, you will see why they're called the elephant tree. So not leaves, but the actual trunks and branches are reminiscent of elephant's legs and trunks. Then we have something called the ostrich fern. It's a very common and popular um, vase-shaped fern, uh, and you can see why, because uh, the fronds resemble the plume shape of the large ostrich feather. So we're going to come back and talk about ferns in a little bit, but that's why you've got ostrich fern, because it's reminiscent of a large ostrich feather. Zebra grass, you can guess why. It's a true grass whose common name, zebra, and cultivar name, zebrinus, alludes to the stripes on the plant's leaves, which are reminiscent of a, of a zebra's stripe. So again, both the cultivar name Zebrinus and the common name zebra grass reflect the animals with them. Then we have these wonderful, wonderful family of plants called monkey flowers. Now monkey flowers get their name because apparently the flowers of some species have a shape resembling a monkey's face sticking out its tongue. Now I love monkey flowers. 
They're California natives, and I have a number of them planted in my garden. There's some species that are not native to California, but but I have those that are. And I've never noticed a little monkey face in the flower. Now, maybe I have a species that doesn't look like a monkey face, but look it up yourself. There's so many different kinds, so you might have to just poke a little bit. But I looked at some YouTube videos and indeed you can see, you can see it has like a little bit where like there's a little shape where like a little bit of it looks like its tongue is sticking out. I don't care. It's an entomology and we've got another one in monkey flower. Sometimes it's called sticky monkey flowers and you might see them associated with the mimulus. Let's move on to uh, fungi. So we've got some fungi, fungi named after animals as well. And so I mentioned this one is a little similar to what we already talked about. We've got the hen of the woods. Maybe you've heard of that. You've most likely heard of the Japanese name, which is a maitake. So maitake mushroom, which is one of my favorite mushrooms, it's amazing. It's also called hen of the woods because of the frond-like growths that resemble the feathers of a fluffed up chicken. And you can again just look it up, just search for it, and you will see indeed uh, that you can see a fluffed up chicken feathers, and that's why it's called hen of the woods. Maitake mushrooms in Japan are known as the dancing mushroom. According to a Japanese legend, a group of Buddhist nuns and wood cutters met on a mountain trail where they discovered a fruiting of maitake mushrooms emerging from the forest floor and they started to rejoice at the discovery of this delicious mushroom so they started dancing in celebration that had nothing to do with animals but I thought it was the most adorable story that's why they're also called uh, dancing mushrooms in Japan I think that's just adorable so moving on from hen of the woods, we have the lobster mushroom. Now I'm not going to get into the fact that this apparently isn't a mushroom at all. It's really a parasite that grows on select species of mushrooms. But if you're a mushroom aficionado and you forage, like you would know that way more than me. But uh, but as for why it's called a lobster mushroom, it has an orange red color reminiscent of a lobster. And apparently it also has a very seafood like smell. I've really never noticed that. I don't have lobster mushrooms that often, but indeed I have eaten them and they do have, they do have a texture of, of lobster. The few times I ate lobster um, when I was eating animals and uh, you could see why. As for the red color, I just want to remind you, if you have Color Me Vegan or I think I've done a podcast episode on it. The color, like lobsters in the wild aren't red. I'll leave that to you to understand. Like they're only red once they're boiled. So it's very interesting. Our association with lobsters as being red, they're actually not red in the wild. But uh, we'll, we'll talk about that another time. I just think it's really interesting. So anyway, apparently these are foraged mushrooms. They're not easy to find. They're found mostly in old growth forests in North America, specifically the Pacific Northwest. Uh, so that makes them even just more exciting for people to find because they're foraged mus mushrooms. But indeed, lobster mushroom animology. And then finally, our last mushroom is the porcini. Have you ever noticed that the word porcini comes from Latin porcus, meaning pig? The connection is uncertain. It might be because pigs have ha, like have an affinity for porcini mushrooms and when the pigs have an affinity for a lot of things. They're not very discerning when it comes to food. It's true, it's true, but it is true. And especially with mushrooms and delicious things, they love them. So like with truffles, that kind of thing, they will gobble them up in a second. So possibly because of that, they were called porcini, uh, but it's also possible because the, possibly because the big round cap looks like the body of a pig. It's a bit of a stretch, but possibly look it up yourself. See if you can see a pig there, but Nonetheless, porcini is in the name, pig is in the name, and that is all I need. Therefore, it's an entomology. It's actually not all I need, and I'm, I'm being facetious, because I am going to talk a little bit later on about some that sound like they're actually animals, but they're not. Uh, like, And I've done this episode when I've talked about expressions that sound like they're animals, but they're not, like piggyback it has nothing to do with pigs. And so, uh, so it does matter. I do want the meaning to have to do with animals, not just the word, but in this case, 
there's probably an association. So just to round out this category, we have two more plants that are named for animals, not necessarily because you can see the anatomical resemblance, but because they're reminiscent of animals. And for one, we have that succulent plant I just mentioned uh, called hen and chicks. And then there's another one as well uh, that, that I'll mention. So these are two just because of the characteristics, the qualities of the plants reminded the person who named them of animals, but they don't necessarily resemble animals the way the ones I just named did. So hen and chicks, they're pretty little succulents. They're both kind of red and green color. We see them all around us in our neighborhood, all over Oakland, all over the Bay Area. I have some in our gardens as well. And in Europe, hens and chicks were originally planted on roofs to help reduce fire by lightning on thatch roofed houses. Seems like California should take a cue from that <laughs> because fire and... Yes. So uh, they're succulents. That's why obviously they would be able to slow down fires by the excess water they store inside of them. So that's, that's why they're really beneficial. I wonder if anyone has talked to those in charge here in California to plant more hens and chicks. So why are they called hens and chicks? And it has to do with, similar to the spider plant, it has to do with their growing characteristics. They grow in little rosettes. The larger rosettes are called hens, while the smaller rosettes are called the chicks. And you can see it when you're watching, when you're looking at the plants and you can see how they grow. You've got the large rosette and you can see little baby rosettes alongside growing all around the mama rosette. So as the chicks become larger, they produce more chicks as their offspring and then they create this mental image of a mother hen with all of our chicks. It was pretty cute. So they're usually grown for their foliage. They spread between one and two inches in width. They're super, super adorable. And they do flower. They do flower once, but it's mostly that they're just so cute. And then after the hen um, flowers, she does die. But she's usually produced so many chicks that they just keep taking her place. It's a very sweet plant, hens and chicks. And then the other one that is named such possibly, possibly because of its feet, of it, the way it feels, possibly because of... Yeah, I think that's probably mostly what it is. Not So it's not because it looks like um, an animal part, but because it feels like an animal part. And that's the pussy willow. So they're called catkins in the UK. Pussy willows were one of my favorite plants when I was little. I don't know why there were so many pussy willows in my life, but I remember like I have very <laughs> vivid memories from my childhood of like petting pussy willows. I don't know if there were a lot growing around me in, in New Jersey. I have no idea. But the at the tail end of winter, fuzzy little nubs start to appear along the branches of pussy willows. And these soft, furry, silver tufts, uh, as well as the plant itself, they're named for the resemblance to the soft fur of tiny cats paws hence pussy pussy tails and paws or tails or what have you but little cats so pussy pussy willows and there are apparently many tales and legends about these plants that have made their way into children's books and, and stories they have something to do with cats and pussy willows but i couldn't get into all of that but you can see why um the plants themselves are named after the fur of cats they're really soft really, really pretty, really fuzzy. And I want to pet one right now. That's just, that's what I want. So super fun, right? You've got all these plants named because they resemble anatomical parts of animals, paws, claws, teeth, faces, wings, tails, eyes, and ears. And you can see some of the characteristics as well. We also have categories of plants named after animals because of other qualities, including smell and sound. Yes, Sound. How interesting is that? So there is a plant, the Burginia cordifolia, commonly known as the pig squeak. It's one of the more unusual plant names um, because it doesn't refer to what the plant looks like. It refers to the sound the plant makes. Now, you wouldn't know this from the scientific name, uh, Burginia cordifolia. The genus name honors German physician and botanist Carl August von Bergen. So Burginia, he was an 18th century botanist. And then cordifolia refers to the heart, corda, C-O-R-D, heart uh, folia leaves refers to the heart-shaped leaves but if you rub the large leaves between your thumb and forefinger you can hear the sound of a pig they say squeaking i think it sounds more like a grunt or a snort but indeed it sounds like a little pig snort uh i used to be able to do a little pig snort i don't think i want to do that right now because it's to be too embarrassing but uh, you can go to youtube if you just type in uh, pig squeak or virginia cordifolia and you can hear the sound of actual pigs when you rub these leaves together it's pretty cute then we have 
Then we have um, the emu berries. It's a shrub species widespread in tropical and subtropical areas of Eastern Australia and Northwestern Australia. And I'll just say this, aside from emu berries, the common names are also dog's balls and diddle diddle. So if you look at a picture, you can see why. I'm going to say no more. Emu berries, dog's balls. You can see why. So etymology in both emu berries and the dog's balls, diddle diddle. I think you could just use your imagination. So then we have a flowering perennial plant, one of the first plants to emerge in the spring throughout eastern Canada and the northeastern United States. And it gets its name from the unpleasant odor it emits, and that is the skunk cabbage. Now, the scent is a way for the plant, obviously, to attract pollinators that are attracted to rotting meat, Blech. rotting flesh. The scent is especially noticeable when the plant is injured. Now, so that's why it's called the skunk cabbage. I think I may have mentioned this before, but I actually love the smell of skunk. I've never been sprayed, and I don't want to be, and I never had a dog who was sprayed, but and I've heard enough stories to know that I don't want to be sprayed and I don't want an animal of mine to be sprayed. But the smell of skunk scent in the air, I love that smell. And I know I'm not the only one. I have talked to other people who say they also love that smell. If you do, I want to know you can join my club, especially if you're a cilantro hating skunk odor loving vegan animologist, then you're in my club. It's a very small club, as you can see, but <laughs> I know we can, we can, we can build it out. So, uh, so skunk cabbage. Then we have a very common food you have eaten a number of times, possibly, possibly, and that's the horseradish. Horseradish. Have you ever thought of why there's a horse in horseradish, right? You can see it in horsetail because the plant looks like the tail of a horse, but why is this root vegetable that we associate with that hot spicy condiment called horseradish? Why why horses? Do horses eat it? Does it look like a horse? What gives? So no, horses don't eat horseradish. In fact, the plant itself is inevitable inevitable. Inedible. <laughs> it is inevitable. It's inedible. Uh, it's only the pungent root that we eat. So the presence of the horse in this context may be to refer to something large and coarse and rough, like when we say horse play, something big and rough and, and coarse, right? And so it's possible that this type of radish, big and large and coarse and strong, tasting possibly, is why it's called horse radish. It just alludes to the strength of a horse, not a horse itself. And then we have Coyote brush. Coyote brush is a shrub in the daisy family native to California, Oregon, and Washington. Early pioneers called it fuzzy wuzzy, which I love because of its silky haired seeds. But it's called coyote brush apparently because it's been suggested that the plant itself, obviously there's a bit of anthropomorphizing going on here, is tricky and adaptable like a coyote. So apparently it takes different growing forms uh, in different, it takes on different growing forms in different habitats, and it has many tricks like that for survival, including adapting its growth pattern to the environment. As I just said, um, it has small wax-covered drought-resistant fire-retardant leaves that taste bad. It has a large root system. So apparently it's just very clever and very adaptable, like a coyote. So in a very positive way, it's called coyote brush. And then we have plants named after animals because the animals eat them, right? So we have, and we'll go through some of these. So that's a whole other category. I was trying to find a way to categorize these as to why they're called different things. And you can see what I've done. I've broken them up into the, the, the parts of the anatomy that resemble animals, the characteristics of animals that they're named after, uh, including uh, the smell or the scent or the, uh, the sound of an animal. And then we have a uh, animalogical plants named such because of the animals who eat them. So one of those plants is called the horse chestnut. So we've talked about horse tail, we've talked about horse radish, horse tail named because of its resemblance to a horse's tail, horse radish because it's reminiscent of a sh the strength of a horse. Uh, and then we have horse in the name of some plants, not because they look like horses or allude to horses, but because horses like to eat them. So the scientific name of the tree commonly known as the horse chestnut is Aeschylus 
hippocastanum. And you can see, if you've been paying attention to the episodes I've been doing, hippo, you know, is Greek for horse, right? As in hippodrome, which was an ancient racetrack, a horse racetrack. Uh, uh, hippopotamus, which technically means river horse. We've talked about that. So why is a horse so prominent in both the Latin and the common the common name for this plant. So the story goes that when the tree was brought to Britain in 1616 from the Balkans, it was called horse chestnut because the Turks, who had taken over the Balkans, uh, would feed the seeds to their ailing horses. Today, the tree is grown mostly for ornamental purposes in towns and private gardens and parks along streets, but there you have it, horse chestnut, because... Uh, because the, the 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 nuts were given to horses and they like to eat it. But we also have some other um, weeds, plants, herbs, whatever you want to call them, with horse in their names for the same reason. Horse mint, horse parsley, horse vetch, all most likely named for the horses who like to eat them. Then we have elephant grass. It's an important forage plant for elephants in Africa, hence its name. It's also suited to cattle and buffaloes, which means, unfortunately, it's used in the dairy and meat industries in East Africa. Elephant grass is the way alfalfa would be used here, but it's originally named for the elephants who forage on it in the wild. And then we have one of my favorite, one of my favorites, just because it's related to cats, and that's catnip. That's an herb of the mint family. It's noted for its very aromatic leaves, which are particularly enticing to cats. Catnip is commonly grown by cat people like me for their cats, and the dried leaves are often used as stuffing for cat playthings, or I could just sprinkle some dried catnip all around and my cats go nuts. Uh, the, nerb, the herb the herb is uh, native to Eurasia, the nerb, that's why I said the nerb, the nerb, Eurasia, and it's used as a seasoning and medicinal tea for colds and fever in some places as well. Now, both catnip and cat mint are derived, um, the names are derived because they both um, emit a very intense re attraction in about two thirds of cats. Uh, not all cats, and it's one of the conversations cat people have with each other is whether or not their cats react to catnip or cat mint, because not all of them do, but mine do. Uh, but that's why they're named. And many people refer to the related plants catnip and catmint interchangeably, but they are two separate species. However, they both have effects on cats. And so catnip and catmint because of their association with cats. Then we have the name of a plant named such because of also, the, the animal who loves that plant, when that's the, butter, the butterfly bush. As the name suggests, these shrubs are known as magnets for butterflies. They also attract other pollinators. They are beautiful, beautiful shrubs. They can also be invasive in some parts of the country. I think there are states that, that prohibit people from even buying them or planting them. I think Oregon does. And so I've had some difficulty think I've like, my husband loves them because yes, they do attract pollinators. But if you get the seeded butterfly bush, that's the problem is that they seed and they become invasive, but they now have sterile varieties. So you can plant a butterfly bush and not have that problem with the invasiveness. And I do recommend that because obviously if it's taking over any native plants, that's a problem. So look for maybe where you are, they're native, but definitely look for the seedless varieties of the butterfly bush. And butterflies do indeed absolutely love them. So butterfly bush. We also have buffalo grass because it was the grass American bison preferred to eat. Uh, so that's buffalo grass. We have elk thistle for the same reason. Most animals love the flowers uh, that are in full bloom in the spring of thistles. So elk thistles because elks uh, loved to eat them or love to eat them. The thistle is native to Alaska, Yukon, on Northwest Territories, Alberta, uh, Alberta, British Columbia, and Wyoming. But bears and deer also like to eat the plant. But they're not called bear thistle, are they? Or deer thistle. They are called elk thistle. Buffalo clover is given the name because apparently they occurred, they grew mostly along buffalo trails through the woods. And then we have some flowers. We have two flowers, very similar. One is called the cowslip and one is called the oxlip. Now, if you look at the plant, name you might think it's cow cow's lip but it's not it's not actually cow's lip but cow is in there indeed so this plant has been around for ages and the word it's basically a compound word 
cow and slip. It's from Old English, uh, cow, you can guess, it's coo, Old English coo for cow, and then uh, Old English slippa for the word slime, possibly meaning cow dung, possibly because the plant was often found growing amongst the manure in cow pastures. Um, an alternative derivation story is that it refers to slippery or boggy ground. So again, slimy, slippery, boggy ground, um, which is a typical habitat for this plant where, the, where cattle would also roam. Uh, so they're originally a wildflower found in open meadows and pastures. Unfortunately, um, they're now rarely seen in the wild, the cow slip, um, but, they're, but they're named for cows possibly because the cattle would graze upon them um, when they were let out to pasture or because they grew in the manure in those cow pastures. Now, oxlip, like cowslip, is oxlip. Um, it's a spe species of primrose, and apparently much is made <laughs> about the difference between the two, especially in the UK. Apparently, true oxlips are a rare ancient woodland species restricted to a certain part of the country. So if you're outside of Cambridgeshire or Suffolk or Essex, like Apparently, if you see that flower, it's a cowslip and not an oxlip. So that's just not the hill I want to die on. But apparently, that means a lot to a lot of people. <laughs> so for our purposes, both of them are named for the animals, cowslip and oxlip, because they thrive in boggy pastures used by cattle. And then we have the emu bush. It's a low-spreading shrub native to Australia. Its scientific name comes from the Greek word meaning desert-loving plant or lover of solitude. But the common name refers to the fact that emus will feed on the fleshy fruits of some species. So we're going to stop there. I'm going to list some later on. And if you get the transcript, if you're a supporter, you will see in the transcript it's a supporter at $10 a month and beyond and up. But if you get the, you'll see in the transcript, I'm going to have a whole list of others, but I can't go through every single one. And there's, I'm sure there's plenty I'm missing. And there's some that I didn't even include in the list because, because the name is just a little more obscure and you're not going to see it very obviously. But, but there you have more names, more animologies, more animological plants named because of the animals who eat them. And before I get into the animals hiding in the names of plants, specifically in the botanical names, and these are super fun because you didn't know they were there, but there they are hiding in the, in the botanical names. Super excited to tell, to tell you about these. But before I get to those uh, hidden animologies, I want to mention a category of animological herbs that have the word bane in them, plus the names of different animals. So you've probably heard of leopard's bane, dog bane, rat's bane, mouse bane, hen bane, flea bane, wolf's bane, you've probably heard of. The last one is most familiar to you if you read medieval literature or fantasies, uh, fantasy books like set in the Middle Ages, wolf's bane. Uh, well, the current word bane is from an old English word bana, B-A-N-A, -A, meaning murderer. And we see it in writing for the first time around 800 AD in the Anglo-Saxon uh, Chronicles and in Beowulf. Later, it came to mean a thing that causes death, like poison. And so in botany, we have this archaic element in the common name of plants known to be toxic or poisonous and named such because they were originally thought to be poisonous to certain animals. So we have leopard's bane, dog bane, rat's bane, mouse bane, hen bane, flea bane, and wolf's bane because of them, you know, apparently being uh, poisonous to these animals. Well, they are. Uh, they're just poisonous in general. Uh, you may have heard of a uh, flea bane. Uh, it's also called pennyroyal. And that is indeed used as a flea and tick repellent. But hundreds of plants fall into these genus of plants that are poisonous. In the case of wolf's bane, you also have the Greek botanical name, uh, which which also refers to uh, a wolf. So, and, and apparently that one possibly is because it was used to poison arrows or baits used to kill wolves. Either way, you have animological plants in these bane herbs, dog bane, rat's bane, flea bane, and that's why. So before we go on, I want to thank you again for your support. The announcement I made in the beginning, I... I am so excited by this change that Patreon made. When I was first soliciting uh, contributions from listeners, when, I mean, this podcast started 14 years ago, and, you know, I set it up through, I think it was just PayPal. I don't even know if PayPal existed that long ago. Maybe it did, but it was just set up. And so people could become 
it was part of a membership. And you could become a member either by making a monthly donation or you can make your annual donation. And of course, the benefit to that is that you make your annual donation, your annual support based on the level that you want the perks for, based on the level that you feel you can contribute to support this work. And the, that's a benefit to you. The benefit to me is that I don't have to worry about your credit card not working each month. And so I said to you in the last episode, and I'll say it again. So I said to you in the last episode that the the um, contributions were down. They're down even more. We did have some wonderful supporters who stepped up, but they keep going down. And one of the reasons they keep going down is because people become monthly supporters out of the goodness of their heart and out of the best intentions, but they don't check to see if they are actually getting charged. And so their credit card changes or it stops working or it gets lost or they have to replace it. And they don't go and renew their pledge on Patreon. And so I don't have the bandwidth. I don't have a staff. I can't go chase people down and ask them to please go check their credit card. It's not, it's declining. It's not working. You know, that's just not how I want to spend my time. That's not why you're supporting me. But that's that's a reality that if I had the bandwidth, if I had the support, I'd be able to do that. But that's one of the reasons I'm certain support is down. The annual uh, patronage that you can pledge, that means you you say, yep, I want to do $30 a month, but I'm going to do that as an annual payment. Here you go. Done for the year. You're, you're still valid. You're there. You're, uh, you're active. You get all of the perks. You get the bonuses. You get the discounts. And we don't have to like worry about your credit card. Isn't that amazing? It really is a huge benefit. So if you want to become a supporter at the annual level, you still You'll just go and pick whatever level you want. You still get all the same perks, but you just pay annually as opposed to monthly. And I would be so grateful for that. And if you're a monthly and you're about to run out or you can switch it over, please go over to your Patreon account. I cannot emphasize enough how grateful I am that Patreon has put this, uh, this feature into place. So so please go over there and check it out, patreon.com slash Colleen Patrick Goudreau. Like I said, we do have some supporters who stepped up at um, $5 a month and $10 a month, and every little bit helps. And one of them was Beth Kramer Mazur, and I'm hoping that her letter will inspire you to support this work. She wrote, Dear Colleen, I wanted to thank you for your incredible work. I'm a big fan of your writing, especially The Joyful Vegan. What an incredible book that warrants reading more than once and your podcast. I just signed up to be a Patreon supporter as a sign of gratitude for your work. I can't wait to read the transcripts to past podcasts as a benefit to supporting you on Patreon. As sometimes you say, just the perfect little nugget that I want to remember however I failed to write down. I work in the Jewish community as a rabbi and educator. I try to bring the messages from our plant-based movement to my community in whatever ways I can, hopefully bearing in mind some of the communication best practices that you've discussed in your writing and podcasts. I'm trying to have an impact without being too hardcore, always a juggling act. Again, thank you for all your critically important work. You're making the world better, more than you know, warmly, Beth. I'm, I am choking up as I'm reading this. Beth, thank you so much. Um, thank you for your support and for your kind words. And uh, and thank you to my heroic platinum and gold supporters, Morgan Hall, Nina Bircher, Jennifer Watkins, Rangini Mohan, Michal Stone, and David Cabrera and Alexander Gray. I, I, I don't know what I would do without you. I honestly don't. And I don't know what I would do if support just keeps going down like this. I've said before, I don't have a boss. I don't have an HR department. I don't get a regular paycheck. You are my support. And so thank you to everybody who just kicks in $5, $10, 20, 30, 50, 100, every anything you can do. It goes a long way in me being able to do this work. Thanks to the new supporters, as I said, Beth Kramer Mazur, uh, Anne Riley, Michelle Hancock, Jade Young, Sophia Zabo, Trina Gately, Allison Kogan, Genevieve Nierman, Megan Perkins, Kathy Taylor, and Jen Kay. Visit patreon.com slash Colleen Patrick Goudreau or just go to joyfulvegan.com and click on the donate button. So let's move on to flowers whose names you are no doubt familiar with, but who have animals hiding within you didn't even know didn't even know so let's start with lupin l-u-p-i-n-e this is any of num- numerous plants of the genus lupinoso of the pea family having uh these compound leaves and colorful flowers grouped in spikes they're super 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 pretty some species are cultivated as ornamentals some have edible seeds the word lupin can you figure it out lupin lupine comes from Latin lupinus, meaning wolf-like. 
Why? Well, we don't know for certain. <laughs> we can only speculate. One theory is that in ancient times, it's a very far-fetched theory. But here you go. In ancient times, you ready for this? Europeans noticed that lupins grow on poor soil where no other plants ventured. In fact, they can live in such places because the bacteria in their roots remove nitrogen from the air, fix it inside the plant, and supply nitrogen fertilizer that the soil lacks. That's pretty amazing. So these early Europeans assumed that they had taken some nutrients from the soil that other plants needed. Thinking the plant was like a wolf robbing the fold, they called it wolf-like. <laughs> it might be a little too cutesy. That's always a sign that that's not a true etymology, or in this case, animology, when the origin story is just too cute for words. But that's what we have. Indeed, a wolf is in the word lupin. Lupine would be the adjective for, for wolf-like, right? And uh, there's no doubt it's an etymology, but that's, the, that's one of the legends about why it's called lupin why there's an animal in it. Delphinium, I mentioned, I'm going to repeat it again, so it's in its own category. Delphinium is from Latin delphinium, delphinium probably, uh, meaning dolphin, and it uh, refers to the nectar secreting structure on that plant that resembles a leaping dolphin. So go look it up, you can see it, and then larkspur, remember we said was related, and that also has a lark spur in the name. A uh, columbine, columbines are the most beautiful woodland plant they're so gorgeous and and it, it's the columbine uh, flower is from the genus aquilegia so i hope you can see the animal in that word aquilegia a q u i legia l e g i a that's the genus and you get both the animology in the common and in the in the scientific uh, you get two for one so i'm going to give you a second but if i describe someone's known as a nose as aquiline if it's an aquiline nose do you remember what that means it means curved or hooked like an eagle's beak aquiline so aquilegia uh, is derived from the latin word for eagle aquila because of the shape of the flower petals which are said to resemble an eagle's claw the common name columbine comes from the latin word for dove due to the resemblance of the inverted flower to five doves clustered together. It's kind of a sweet image. So do an image search. You can see for yourself the curved shape of the flower petals and the cluster of flowers resembling the group of doves. And you can see also the eagle, the eagle's claw in the shape of the flower petals. Then we have Coreopsis. It's a perennial flower. So did you know, I mean, can you see that, right? You, I mean, who would have thought Wolf is in lupin, a dolphin's in delphinium, a dove is in columbine. You can, if you know your etymology and, and, and study it, uh, of course, seeing the, the eagle in the genus, who would have thought? Coreopsis is another etymology. It's a perennial flower we have here at our house. In fact, right outside my office is where it has grown in the past. We didn't plant it if previous owners would have planted it. And um, it's not doing great right now, but it but it is perennial. It's very pretty, uh, pretty yellow flowers that appear in late summer. It's also called tick seed. So again, we have two etymologies for the price of one, both in Coreopsis, and actually we have three, in Coreopsis and in tick seed. And it's not called tick seed because it attracts ticks. It's called tick seed because its small seeds resemble teetsy, teetsy, tiny, teensy, little baby, itsy, bitsy ticks little tiny seeds look like ticks. And that's where the name comes from. It comes from Greek chorus, meaning insect, meaning bug, plus appearance, opsis. And so it's in reference to the bug-like shape of the seeds. So you have the animal in the scientific name, Coreopsis. You have the animal in the common name, tick seed. But there's an animal in the type of Coreopsis called a mouse ear Coreopsis. So if you look it up, you'll see that each leaf has a distinctive pair of small lateral lobes at the base of the blade, which resemble the shape of ears. Hence the common names of mouse ear coreopsis, but it's also called ear-leaved tick seed. <laughs> so either way, you have a number of animologies in that one flower. 
Then we have the name of the seed husks of a particular family of plants that are called psyllium. Cilia would be the, this, the, all of them together. Psyllium is the, is, you've heard of psyllium. We've talked about this in the episode on the names for colors that come from animals. The Greek word for flea is psylla, P-S-Y-L-L-A. Psylla is Greek for flea. And that's how we get our word psyllium, uh, as in the concentrated fiber that acts as a natural laxative, which as you might know, is sold under the brand name Metamucil. But you can just buy psyllium husks in a natural food store for the same effect, a lot cheaper. And that's what, and that's, that's basically what it is. It's a laxative. So the point is psyllium comes from the Greek word for flea, because the seeds themselves are so tiny that they look like fleas. So psyllium is an entomology. I mentioned fern before. Um, we have this entire family of these gorgeous, ancient, non-flowering plants called ferns. I love ferns. We planted a fern garden recently in a shady part of our yard. And the word fern comes from the Old English fern, uh, fern meaning um, basically feather or wing. It comes from a Proto-Indo-European word meaning feather or wing, as in the body part of, of, an, of, a, of a bird in flight. So that means our ostrich fern is kind of redundant, right? Because... It's named for the resemblance, but in this case, it's res- the resemblance to a specifically, specifically the ostrich plume. But ostrich fern refers to the plume, the plumage, the feathers of, uh, of, a, of a bird, and all ferns would be entomologies in that case. Then we have this word, I just decided to keep it because I wanted to see if you remembered the entomology um, here. So myosotis, myosotis, um, M-Y, I'm trying to break it up so you can hear the myo, M-Y-O, so myosotis. Um, this is a genus that includes forget-me-nots, and we've talked about this root. If you remember the episode we did on the anatomy parts for an- that, have an- that have animals in them, our anatomy parts, our body parts, like Muscle, remember we said uh, M-U-S, moose, uh, is Latin for uh, mouse, and Greek myo is, well, it's Greek for mouse, and so uh, words like muscle and myocardial uh, both have mouse in them, so you have it here in myosotis. Uh, they're named such, this genus of flowers are named such because the foliage uh, is thought to resemble the ear of a mouse. Then we have a word that if you look at it, you might be tempted to pronounce bug gloss. It's B-U-G-L-O-S-S. Oh, so you might want to say bug and you might see that's where the etymology is. It's actually not where the etymology is. The word is pronounced boo gloss, B U. G-L-O-S-S, Blue Gloss, Blue Gloss, B-U-G-L-O-S-S. And they are several, usually hairy, old world plants having blue or violet flowers. And the word comes from Middle English, Blue Gossa, from Old French, from Late Latin, basically from Greek, from the Indo-European word B-O-U-S, which I hope you remember, Bous, B-O-U-S, meaning ox, right? And Glossa, in this case, our plant here, Glossa meaning tongue. So it literally means ox tongued because of the shape and texture of its leaves. So just a reminder that we've talked about this Proto-Indo-European root before, cow or ox, and B-O-U-S, this, uh, th- that means cow or ox. And we see it in the words bovine, we see it in the word bucolic, we see it in the words bulimia, we see it in bugle, and we see it in bullocks. That's where that's we get those words from the word for ox or cow. I'm going to do an entire episode. I've been meaning to do an entire episode on bovine words. I thought I had, but I looked back and I don't think I did. I've just been keeping notes on them for so long. I thought I did an episode. So that's bugloss, is this genus of plants whose leaves look like Exactly. <laughs> the tongue of an ox. Boo gloss. Then we have celandine. It's a perennial uh, herb having deeply divided leaves, showy yellow flowers, and yellow orange latex. It's also called swallow wart. So celandine is the botanical name, but swallow wart is the common name and you can see the clue there for the animal hiding within it came into english um the word celandine did from greek uh kalendon, meaning swallow as in the bird apparently from the association by ancient writers of the blossoming of the plant with the return of the swallows in the spring and actually the dying of the plant when the swallows leave i think it's a very beautiful romantic uh, reason for calling this plant celandine or swallowwort and you can see the animal within 
because of that. And then finally, I'm going to end with one that I mentioned before, and that's the geranium. Geranium comes from Latin, uh, uh, well, geranium, <laughs> from Greek uh, geranos, geranos, meaning crane, as in the bird crane. And it's called such because the shape of the seed pods is similar to cranes' bills. Now, I said earlier that their, the native name in English was also crane's bill when we were talking about crane's bill. So you've got your botanical name geranium and your common name uh, crane's bill because of the seed pods resembling the bill of a crane of a bird. So, and as an as a bonus, I'm working on this because there's some indication that the word cranberry, as in the berry, cranberry, might be an etymology also related to the word crane. But stay tuned, I'm not really sure. So before I close, I just want to just anticipate some questions you might have about some plants that sound like they're related to animals, but I hate to break it to you, don't appear to be. Remember that episode I did on words and expressions, like I mentioned in the beginning of this episode, like words like piggyback or expressions like piggyback or monkey wrench. I did a whole podcast episode in animology about words that you think sound like they're from animals, but actually are not. Uh, and so I thought I would do the same thing for some plants that you think might be related to animals, but either aren't or we're not sure. And so this is some, some, some possible, uh, some deceptively animological seeming words. Anyway, you get the idea. So foxglove would be one of them. So the scientific name for foxglove is digitalis. And many people are familiar with that because it's actually used as heart medication. Um, but digitalis is named, and that's easy to figure out why it's named that. It comes from the Latin word digitus for finger. Because if you look at the foxglove flowers, if you look at the digitalis, it looks like a thimble that can be easily fitted over a finger. I said that right, a thimble? I'm second guessing that I said thimble and finger. So it looks like a thimble that can be fitted over a finger. And Latin um, uh, digitus means finger. And you can see why it's called digitalis. But why foxglove? That is the big question. Even in Old English, it was called foxus glofa. And so it's possible that that was referring to a different plant altogether. The, the, the professionals, the experts are not sure. And no one's been able to figure out why the Anglo-Saxons called it foxglove. So you can see it in digitalis. And um, purple is the common, it's, it's usually called digitalis pur pur purpurea um, because it's purple. But why fox? So it's possible. It's possible. And we can maybe call it an etymology if we want to. But here's a possibility. In the 16th century, which doesn't explain why it was used in Anglo-Saxon times, but in the 16th century, um, there was a doctor's name. His name was Leonard Fuchs, F-U-C-H-S, and his surname translates into Fox. Fuchs, F-U-C-K-S, um, translate to Fox, translates to Fox. He applied the genus digitalis to describe the plant we call digitalis. And then soon after that, it was commonly referred to as foxglove. So that's why the Old English plant that we know as foxus glypha might be a completely different plant altogether when we see that referenced in um, Anglo-Saxon chronicles. So possibly we're just confusing the, the name of the plant now for, for foxglove. But possibly what happened is this particular Leonard Fuchs, this German doctor who um, gave us the genus digitalis, the word um, foxglove, you know, came for, as, a, as a basically an homage to him because Fuchs means fox. It makes sense. So so possibly, I mean, because his word, his name means fox, but nah, it's not because it's, you know, resembled an animal or anything like that. Then we have a plant called gooseberry, and it's, it seems like it, now it's called a gooseberry, which seems it would have to do with geese, but it doesn't from the origins of the word. The old German name for the berries was Krauselberry. I'm not saying that with a very good German accent, it's, but K-R-A-U-S-E-L-B-E-R-E, -E -E, um, which literally means curled or crimped berries. And that was the source of the medieval Latin name, uh, Grausolaria, 
and then it became another word in French. The point is, it became gooseberry in English because the R was dropped. So it was originally krauselberry, and then krauselaria, and then it became then gooseberry. We lost the R. So it, we weren't supposed to lose the R, <laughs> but that's how language works. So we lost the R, and now it's gooseberry, but it has nothing to do with geese. So even though you see a goose in gooseberry, it's really not an animology in the sense that it doesn't really have anything to do with animals. Then we have wolfberry, uh, which is a shrub native to China, and we know it by the common name, and it has many, many names, but we know it as the goji berry. So wolfberry, uh, no one knows why it's called wolfberry. No one has any idea. The scientific name was Lyceum, uh, L-Y-C-I-U-M, and it's possible that the reason why uh, people started calling it wolfberry in English is because they thought, well, that means wolf, uh, that has the root of wolf, lycos in uh, Greek for wolf. Um, but no one knows why wolf is in the Latin name. We just don't know. So well, you can call it wolf berry. Or you can call it goji berry. But we don't know why the wolf is in the berry. And then we have wormwood. It's a species native to temperate regions in Eurasia, Northern Africa, and widely naturalized in the uh, northern United States and Canada. And it's grown as an ornamental plant, wormwood is, and it's used as a medicine and an ingredient in the spirit, you've probably already guessed it, absinthe, uh, and vermouth, and as well as some other alcoholic beverages. Uh, it formerly was used to protect clothes and bedding from moths and fleas and in brewing ale. So the worm, the worm, the word wormwood comes from Middle English, uh, wormwoda, um, and it's possible that that has to do with worm, especially since vermouth also has the Latin word for worm in it. But no one knows for sure. No one knows why why it would be called such. I said that it was used to protect clothing from moths and fleas. Possibly, maybe that's that's why there's some relationship there. But we don't know why. So wormwood is another one. And then we have my favorite tree, bar none. Is that true? Yeah, one of my favorite trees. Top three, eh, top five, top five, top five tree, definitely top five tree is the dogwood. And the dogwood is part of the cornus, right? You've heard of the cornus uh, genus uh, of about 30 to 60 species of woody plants uh, in the family cornicea, commonly known as dogwoods. And they are such beautiful trees. God, I love them. Or, you know, they could be shrubs as well. Uh, and they're distinguished by their blossoms and their berries and their very distinctive bark, white bark. And dogwood, apparently, is a very hard and strong wood. And it's what goads or skewers or dogs, D-A-G-S, were made of. A dog or a daga was a sharp tool. It's probably how we get our word dagger. So the term dogwood could have evolved from that Celtic word dog or daga or dogwood. You could hear how that turns to dogwood, but it could have originally been dog, D-A-G wood. And then now it's dogwood, but it has nothing to do with canines. It has nothing to do with actual dogs, right? The botanical name, however, and I'm going to end on this word that the common name is not an animology, but the botanical name is. So I'm actually putting it into our category of animologies, and that's the cornice. The botanical name cornice reflects the quality, the hardness of something being very hard, like an animal's horn. Remember we talked about cornea, the word cornea, our eye, in the cornea in our eye being called such because it's very hard, like an animal's horn. Well, that's what we have here. The cornice is called, the cornice, this, this genus of dogwoods is called such because it's so hard. Remember I said we also have cornet, horn, capricorn, cornea, cornucopia, all of these are cognates from the word horn, meaning an animal's horn, very hard. So dogwood seems like it's an animology because of dog in the word, but it's actually an animology because of cornus, meaning animal's horn. So that's just a few that aren't necessarily related to animals, um, that we know about 
or whose origins we're just not certain about. Uh, but you can see there are so many plants that are related to animals and so many I didn't even name. I mean, so many, there's thousands. I mean, I've, I listed a whole bunch here and I'm not going to bore you here because I'm just going to include this on the transcript so you can see the list and list and list of more and more and more. And there's more, like everything on here isn't even it. But someday in the animology book, I will include them. So I hope this inspired you. I hope you see animologies everywhere you look, everywhere you listen, when you speak. And I hope you recognize that animals themselves are everywhere you look. They're in our gardens. They're in our language. They're in our consciousness. They're in our hearts. For the animals, this is Colleen Patrick Gaudreau. Thank you for listening. 